up that first slide. Um, I've been weepy uh, for hours. I don't, I'm, I've just been weepy. And I feel, uh, if I could, I'd just lay on the floor for the whole time and wish you'd join me. But I'm hoping that um, this is what I'm after with you. That's a little boy at a camp in Missouri in the 1950s, in the middle of nowhere at a Christian camp. And he's listening to a speaker. And I, I've zoomed in on him. And uh, there are other kids in the audience, and some are cheering, it looks like, and some are laughing, but he's stunned. He's stunned. And I'll be honest, the message that I'm going to give you today is what I gave to the three staffs of the three summer camps I direct. The, it's for the staff, but I found, Lord, I can't let this message go. I still lay in bed at night, and I ruminate on it, and it presses me to the floor in my spirit like an anvil's on me. It's like, how many of you kids have played Mario Brothers? Come on. You're running through the maze, and you know when you get under the steel plate and you're banging it with his helmet? And what's coming out of the top, kids? What is it when you're hitting the, the plate and there's something shooting? What is it, honey? That's right, honey. They're gold coins. That's what this text is doing to me. You don't leave the plate until the coins stop. And that's the same with this text of Scripture. When the Holy Spirit is illuminating it to you, don't leave it. And so this is the sixth time since June I'm giving this message, but I can't get it out of my heart. And I feel like in the nature of the itinerant work that I've been doing for 22 years almost is that the messages God gives me seems to be for the body of Christ at large. So I, unlike, I have the luxury, unlike pastors, where they have to keep continuing in the text, I go back to the same particular messages and pour over them again and again and again and to dig more coins out of them. That just seems to be the nature of what I've been called to. So it's like you know, when uh, Pastor Matt and I were talking about me doing this, it's almost immediate, Lord. I still, I don't want to break their flow because I adore the wrath of God. And I did a video series uh, during COVID, and it was weeks of f focusing on what I called the adorable wrath of God. It's adorable. There's nothing about God that doesn't deserve worship. And so I was so, I, Michael, stay away from that subject. Oh, no. It makes me love him so much more. So there was a part of me, yes, I want to get into the groove of the series you're on and continue it. But it was like, you know, nope, I'm supposed to do this. And so uh, Matthew was so congenial to, that's fine, Dad, whatever you feel. And so, uh, so anyway, uh, I gave it to the three staffs. And what I did, it was to impart vision to the staff. I meet with the camp staff Sunday night. The campers come Monday morning. And I have to give them vision. Because without a vision, you dwell without a care. So this is the original message. So I told the staff, this is what I'm after this week. I want the campers stunned by God. As a 16-year-old in a movie theater in South Jersey, I saw the Ten Commandments for the first time. And I just remember sitting there. I was stunned. And I wouldn't meet the Lord for two more years. So it's like there's an ache that I can't squelch, beloved, that I, do. I long for God's people, including myself, to be stunned. And so um, you can take that down. Thank you so much. So I want to read you. William G.T. Shedd was a 19th century theologian, and he started at Union Theological Seminary before they started having chapels where they repented the trees. Did you know that? They had a chapel a year or two ago, and they gathered in the chapel to repent to trees and plants. But Union had glorious beginnings like Harvard and Yale, too, and Princeton. And it, William G.T. Shedd was in that, and he was, I have his three volumes set, but I was pouring through that last spring preparing for camps, and he cites the story of a woman called Frances Kemble Butler. I had never heard of her before. And this is what is, she was in a near-death experience on a vessel out at sea, I assume in the 19th century. This is what she wrote years later. This is why we do church. This is why we do camps. And I preached this message to a bunch of youth in South Jersey two, a few weeks ago. I felt to give it to them, even though it's about them. This is what she wrote. As the vessel reeled under a tremendous shock, the conviction, the conviction of our impending destruction became so intense in my mind that my imagination suddenly presented to me the death vision. 
so to speak, of my whole existence. And then she said, I should find it impossible adequately to describe the vividness with which my whole past life presented itself to my perception. And she said, it wasn't a procession of events. Some of you have heard about people who had near-death experiences or they were about to drown and it says they saw their whole life in a second. But she said when she saw her whole life in a second, it wasn't like she saw her childhood and then adolescence, teenage years, middle age, senior years. She said she saw the whole thing at one time. Now watch. She saw it as a whole, and she said it was suddenly held up to me as in a mirror. And watch what she said, beloved. She said it was indescribably awful seeing her whole life. Combined with the simultaneous, acute, and almost despairing sense of loss. She saw her whole life in a second, and she felt deep loss. Now watch the next thing she felt, beloved. Waste. Tell me there's an adult in the room who doesn't wish you could do it all over again. And redeem the time that you wasted as you're older now. She felt loss and she felt waste. Now watch. She's feeling overwhelmed. And she, so to, which was accompanied. Then watch now. She said this instantaneous, involuntary, she didn't choose to have this death vision. She said this retrospect, watch now, was followed by a keen and rapid survey of the religious belief in which I had been trained. Now watch. And which seemed to me then, when she thought she was at the point of death, my only important concern. That's what I told the camp staffs. That's why we do camps. The kids right now don't seem that concerned with God and pursuing him and they don't realize how desperately they need them, even as children. But when they're in their seasoned years and they're on the precipice of eternity and death is knocking on their door, they will be like Francis Kemble Butler, won't they? The only thing that matters now is what I learned about the Lord. That's why you do local. Amen. That's why we're here. And I, I have to, these are five pages of notes and my son knows I'm not a note person. Uh, I learned to preach preaching to children. I was afraid to take my eyes off of them. So I didn't look down at the Bible or notes, but I didn't want to miss these things. And so I'm really taking chunks of this out that have just broken my soul. So I'm going to not elaborate on the aspects of children, why they so desperately need that. But we're going to go to the next thing. That's why we do church here. What's the ultimate reason, beloved, that we do local? Why do you keep gathering here week after week? Well, that's an easy one, right? I call it the Holy Halloween verse. That's how you help kids remember it. Of course, the date of Halloween next Sunday is 1031. 1 Corinthians 1031, Holy Halloween. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, you do all to... The glory of God. What does that mean? It means when other people look at you about how you relate to God, how you relate to people, how you relate to pagans, how you perform at work, all the things about your life, they think more highly of him. That's what it means to live for the glory of God. Now, but what does that mean, Michael? There are so many aspects of the glory of God. The scripture has about six of them. I'm just going to elaborate on a few and show you, beloved, which one's the most important. Number one definition of the, of the glory of God, you can turn that up a little bit, bro, is his resplendent glory. God lives and he dwells, 1 Timothy 6, 16, in unapproachable light. Uh, Pastor Matt and his siblings and our family, we grew up with a 1970 musical version of Scrooge. We watched it almost every, every Christmas. Starring Albert Finney. Well, when Finney's in his bed, when Scrooge is in his bed, the spirit of Christmas present is in the other room. Scrooge, come here. Or do I have to come in there after you? And what is Scrooge? I'm coming, I'm coming. And he comes to the door and the, and the, the spirit of Christmas present is so radiating light that the door is glowing. And then he, Scrooge opens the door and he comes in and he's like, what's the matter, Scrooge? Do I need to turn it down a little bit? That's the resplendent glory of God. That's the number one, the, the beginning aspect of his glory. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said something that I absolutely love. He said, God's glory 
talking about his resplendent glory. He said God's glory is his deity sparkling. God's glory is his deity, his essence, what he's made up of, John 4, 23. Spirit, sparkling. It says, beloved, that we are going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. That's, the, that's one. So, Michael, are you saying that we should come here on Sundays and live for that glory of God? Or we're kind of learning it local and we're going to really seek the Lord because we want to live for the resplendent glory of God. I, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't encourage that. What do you mean, Michael? It's, yeah, but you know what? If that started happening, guess what people would come to see? The phenomena... Not the person. But it's, I don't diminish it at all. But that's the glory of God. Number two. The second aspect of the glory of God. Is his power. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 and 8. It says that. The Lord is just and he will afflict those who are afflicting his people. And when is that going to happen? It says this will happen when the Lord Jesus returns in blazing fire with his holy angels. And it says he will mete out punishment to those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel. And then it says this, beloved, in verse nine, it says they will be shut out. And the Greek is literally from the face of the Lord. You and I are desperately longing, are we not? To finally see Jesus. I'm tired of the glass darkly. I want to see him face to face. I can barely stand it. But the pagans and those who die in their sin says they'll be shut out from the face of the Lord. What theologians for centuries have called it the beatific vision. Jesus' face. They'll be shut out from it. Watch now. And the glory of God's power. God's power is part of his glory. So, Michael, do we come here to local and to, to live for that glory? Yes. You desperately, beloved, need the power of God in your gatherings. As the tsunami of paganism and secularism is rapidly overtaking America, when you gather, when people come in here, they've got to know, whoa, there's a different spirit in that place. Right? And say in Corinthians, when someone comes in, an unbeliever, they know because of the manifestation of the power of God, God is in this place. Whatever they're saying is truth because the power of God confirms it. That's why Paul said, I didn't just come to you in words but in a spirit, in a demonstration of power. So that's another aspect of the glory of God that we've got to have. Now watch, um, this same William G.T. said, watch this, he said, the power of God is the essence of God energizing. Just, I just love to meditate on the essence of God, beloved. All the attributes of God and his, what he's made up of, if I was to tell a small child. What is God made up of? And we know, like I said, John 4, 23, he's made up of spirit, eternal, infinite spirit, all perfections. And so Shed goes, the power of God is the essence of God energizing and producing outward effects. That's why when Pastor Matt and the others preach the gospel here, you have people sitting dead in trespasses and sin. No hope of eternal life. And all of a sudden, the power of God hits them. And for things that they used to revel in and enjoy and indulge in, all of a sudden, they're starting to feel remorse. And they want to get out of it. Power of God. People get healed. God moves. That's living for the glory of God. But by far... The aspect of the glory of God that you should be gathering for every Sunday is the most glorious. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, Moses is on the mountain. And he says, Lord, show me your glory. What's the first thing that comes to God's mind? Michael, how do you know what came to God's mind? Because it came out of his mouth. He's not a hypocrite. What is in his mind, he says. What does he say? I will cause all of my glory, all of my goodness to pass in front of you. Well, no, 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 Lord, I ask for glory. And watch what God immediately thinks. I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. That's why the prosperity gospel is so diabolical. When you're a sinner, beloved, you don't need God's money. You need his mercy. You see, it's so wicked. Focus is on stuff that God will give you anyway. You pursue him. But you see, the Lord said, I will cause 
all of my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord there. So what does it say in Exodus 34, 6, 6 and 7? I wrote a song to it when I was a baby Christian decades ago. And so he says, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and the Lord tells him, I will pass by you, but I will cover you so you cannot see my face and live. There it is again. Don't hide your face from me, my king. You cannot see my face and live, but I will cause you to see my hind parts, and then I will proclaim my name. And what does he say? The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives our transgressions, our iniquity, and our sin. Do you see it, beloved? That's the biggest thing of the glory of God that you want to see manifested in your gatherings at local are the perfections of God, his attributes. That's the glory that people fall in love with God for, is all of those attributes that the Lord just named to Moses. And Gertie, what's that for? This is like, I use this my object lesson that's symbolic of all the attributes and the perfections of God, God, which is by far the most important definition of his glory, and which is the number one aspect of the many aspects of his glory that you should strive to live for. And if there's one thing that this desperate world needs when they come is what? To see God in this aspect, his perfections. That's how you know when you've really got someone who's come to him is the biggest aspect of all the aspects of God is his perfections, his attributes that they long for and they want to know him. The glory of God. Now, I'm editing this. Pastor Matt said, Mike, you know, Dad, not a minute past seven, and I'm going to honor that. At least they're paying attention. They laughed, okay? Now watch. There was a scholar named Leighton that William Shedd quoted. He said, since God could propose no higher end as far as what, what do human beings live for? Why are we here? What do we get out of bed in the morning for? He said, since God could have no higher end of why we're here, watch what it says, he proposed himself. Can you imagine, beloved, if God had a purpose that we strove for, that would be above him. He said he couldn't propose anything higher than himself. That's why you get out of bed in the morning. God himself is what we live for. Now watch. The glory of God means such a manifestation of the divine perfections. The glory of God means such a manifestation of the divine perfections. Watch now. As leads cre creatures to worship and adore. Isn't it true, beloved, that the more you see the Lord... In the text of scripture illuminated by the Holy Spirit, something from deep within, you begin to adore. That's a revelation or a, really an illumination of the glory of God. Now he goes like this. Adoration is the highest act of a creature. There's nothing more noble or higher that a human being can do than adore God. Wow. And then watch what he says. And it's when God manifests his perfections, that's what draws it out of you. When you see him for who he is, that causes adoration to erupt. I couldn't get it. My, I, can you see why I can't get this out of my spirit, my heart? I just lay there in bed and I want to dig a hole 35,000 feet deep and just get in it and just, please cover me with all the dirt you can and then put wet blankets and an anvil on top of it because the more I meditate on it, just the weight of his glory, I can't take him. This is what it's doing to me. Now, oh my dear, okay. So, 27 years ago, 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah had similar things. Now watch. Can you show the picture, uh, the, the second picture, please? That's my wife, Kim. Today's her birthday. That's her father. He's been in heaven four years now. Kim was very, very special to her father for two reasons. Number one, she was his firstborn. And number two, she was his only daughter. Something about those two aspects. Kim's got dad's ear. 
You see, when Kim talks in her father's ear, dad listens. You see him paying attention to her? How many of you have cried out to the Lord for years? Lord, incline your ear to me. Please lean over and listen to me. And how many times does it feel like you've called on him for years, but it doesn't feel like he's listening to you? Given who he is, it's impossible for him not to. He can't deny himself. He's like dad with Kim. And may I say just this in passing, the longer I live, the longer I know my wife, and the more I behold our three children and see the character of God in them, the more I see their mother. I see her strengths in them, not me, and I'm happy about it. I see their mother in them. Wow. All right, thank you for that. Wow. So what did he say? Look down to us, Lord, at local from heaven and see from your lofty throne, holy and glorious. Three things that Isaiah cries out for. Where is your zeal? Lord, where are you? Where's your zeal? You know, God is constantly working, beloved, all over the world every single day. And even though it looks to us like many times he's not doing any. Oh, no, no. It's impossible for him not to do anything. But I've noticed that there are many things God does, but he's not zealous about it. There are only some places in scripture when God says he's going to do something that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So my cry at camps was, Lord, Jesus, I want you to, to, to do things here this week, and I want you to be excited about it. Number two, what was Isaiah's second cry? Where's your zeal, and where are your mighty deeds? Like I said earlier, with the power of God, we have got to start seeing God move and manifest himself in ways we haven't known was the third thing and this is the one that's and honey I forget what was it um no I I'm glad you're enjoying the introduction okay here's the one that just this this kills me this is just this one of the three things that Isaiah called out for this is what just crushes me and aches and I'm sick and I don't know how to deal with it it says where are the stirrings of your heart Where's your zeal, Lord? Where are your miracles? And where are the stirrings of your heart? You know what the Hebrew is literally, beloved? It says, where are the agitations of your intestines? And as I studied that and read it and meditated on it, you know what, you know what Isaiah was asking for? Lord, I want to move the deepest depths of you. What do I do to do that, Lord? Where are the agitations of your intestines. Of course, it's an idiom for meaning, Lord, where are your heart stirrings? What can we do to stir you, Lord? At Camp's theme in 2010 was stirred. Speaking of Samson, it says, and the boy grew and the Lord blessed him. Watch now. And the, the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in the camp. You see, God all over the scripture stirs people. I'll never forget as long as I live, I was in a convent in Missouri in the middle of nowhere, 18 years old. I knew God is like, I, I was a dead as a doornail, but that was when the spirit of God first came. He didn't come at me at confirmation in the fourth grade in Catholic school. The bishop touched me, didn't feel a thing, lived for myself for eight years, but I was in a convent at a retreat and my, the spirit of the God stirred me and I've never been the same since. You see, that's what Isaiah is clinging for. So it says, that's what, it, that's what he did for Samson. So it's like, Lord, we preached about you stirring us in 2010. But Lord, what does it take to stir you? And there was a man whose name was David. He's the only man that God ever spoke about like this. I found me David, son of Jesse. He's a man after my own heart. And I got, Lord, and this is what was such an ache in my spirit. And I was sitting in our side room preparing for this last spring. What is it, dear Jesus? What is it? What is it about David that, what did he do, Lord? What didn't he do? Uh, what was he like, Lord, that he's the only one you ever said that about, that he stirs you like that? Can I somehow, Lord, do that? I want to stir you like he did. And I, all I do is mess up. 
I don't know. And all I see is sin and weakness. I don't, but anything, I, I just want to do it, Lord. And I, 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 oh, I could go on a whole diatribe of David, but David was amazing. I mean, his mighty men, a number of them could easily beat David one-on-one, -on -one, I have no doubt. But the reason they didn't and risked their lives for him, because of his walk with God. Another time, a woman tried to deceive him, sent by Joab, and he, David saw right through it, and she goes, my Lord is like an angel of God. You know the difference between good and evil. Mephibosheth is sent, Jonathan's son. My Lord, you are an angel of God. You are like an angel of God. And then, I have no idea when to close, hon. You give me the time. Huh? Huh? Really? Happy, my birthday was last week. Wow. But I, I was sick at heart because I want to get this, what, what God spoke to my heart as I was m m meditating on David. The reasons why. What is it, Lord, that he stirred your heart and I want to? Well, this is what people said about him. And then it says, he was about to go out to battle because Absalom was coming after him. And David, let's go to battle. And he was calling his men. And this is one of the most beautiful scriptures in all the text. One of his men came up to him and said, my Lord, If our men get fearful in the battle, the enemy will not care. Even if half of our men die, my Lord, the enemy will pay no mind. But you, my Lord, you are worth 10,000 of us. What kind of man was he? He's worth 10,000 of the Israelites. And then another guy said to him, or whoever it was, they said, you're not going to fight with us anymore, my Lord, lest the lamp of Israel be extinguished. He was the lamp of Israel. He was their light on the human side. Wow. Now watch what happened, beloved. I'm, I still remember where I was sitting as I was, I was feeling in my heart after musing on these texts, I got to meet him. I really want to meet him so bad when I get to heaven. And I felt the Holy Spirit arrested me almost immediately because, you know, the Holy Spirit is very jealous for the Lord Jesus. Oh, what did Jesus say? He won't speak of himself. He'll take the things of me and show them to you. He will glorify me. So this is what I felt as I was in awe. And I don't think it's, it's sin to really want to meet David, but I love it what the Holy Spirit impressed me with. Michael, if you think... If you're that impressed with David, think of what the son of David is like. I was sitting in the chair, but my spirit was kneeling. You think David's impressive? Think of what the, think of what the son of David's like. Wow. I want to stir him, beloved. And I know you do too, or you wouldn't be here. Your flesh has better things to do. But the new man in you wants to come to church. Amen? Just trying to pick out what we can do. Don't, just, to, just want to make sure I don't leave any of the main things that have just been stirring me like crazy. And here's the thing, beloved, is that, remember we talked about the essence of God, how infinite it is. I'm like, come on now. You've seen the, the statistics of space. Like, just go a few light years away. Well, this galaxy is three billion light years away. And you think of the magnitude and the vastness of the universe. And then you think the one who created it. And somehow, in the electron microscope of the universe, in the electron microscope of the universe, what are you looking for, Gert? I'm trying to find David, much less the Earth. You need, to, you need this to find the earth and the universe. But there's a, little, there's a little speck that's made in God's image, who's David, son of Jesse from Bethlehem. Now watch, microscopic in the electron microscope of the universe, something about him stirred the intestines of God. Doesn't that make you sick to your stomach? I mean, in a glorious way? That's what you want. That's what we want. Uh, this, is what is, this is why I, I, I just can't let go of this text. Um, and, and listen, 
the, Isaiah also cried out in 64, 5, God is a God who acts, he acts, and we desperately in these days need him to move and act and confirm the preached word. It says he acts on behalf of those who wait for him, who wait for him. I love it so much that I get Matt's emails in there, you know, prayer tonight, locals having prayer. boy. that's my boy. We're having prayer. Now watch, and uh, Ben, would you come here, please? Almost done. This is something else that Isaiah, he was lamenting in his day. As he looked around the people of his day, sorry, I usually have a white one for this, but this is what what Isaiah was, was crying out to God for. Lord, he looked around the people of his day and he said, Lord, no one wakes himself up to lay hold of you. No, nobody rouses himself, Lord, to take hold of you. The Hebrew there is to seize and fasten yourself upon. It says in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' enemies tried to get him, to kill him. But it says they couldn't. You know why? They were unable to because all the people hung on him. Thanks, bro. Isaiah looked at his day. No one, Lord, no one stirs themselves up to fasten themselves to you. Our camp theme in 2014 was static cling. I want to hold on to him very tightly and I want to be static about it. Static cling. I'm getting near the end, honey, I promise. Now, what will happen? What will happen if local doesn't do those things? Isaiah also said, Lord... Your people possessed your sanctuary for a little while. Your people possessed your sanctuary for a little while. Does that just tear you to pieces inside? How many of you have seen denominations and churches and movements that were once the cutting edge and they're nothing now? How many of you have seen churches that are now coffee shops and antique stores? What happened to Shiloh, the tabernacle? Gone. What happened to the temple? Decimated by the Babylonians. What happened to the promised land? Israel didn't have it long. You see what happens, beloved? When you let go, your people possessed your sanctuary for a little while. And I know it's the cry of your pastor's hearts. We don't want to have local be a little thing that happened for a little time. We want this to perpetuate. We want this to be a gathering of people where the glory of God, his character, his attributes fills the place that draws sinners who are hungry for mercy. And they know they can come here and find the grace of God and the holiness of God. Wow. This is what I gave to our camp staffs Most of it. Here's another thing. Many are deconstructing today. It's the thing. Isn't it interesting when a famous Christian celebrity deconstructs? They never want to go alone. Have you noticed that? They can't just decide to decide to reject him and hate him and be that for themselves. They want to broadcast it and bring as many people with them as possible. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. And they always have someone to blame for their infidelity to the altogether perfect one who never does anything wrong. You know, God's modus operandi is 100% all the time. He never gets better or worse. I have an object lesson. It's an oscilloscope. Some of you guys might know those TV repairman guys. It has a straight green line. It's straight all the time. And that's God's operation. He always goes 100%. So all these deconstructors, it isn't God's fault. Here's Here's what I told the camp staff. The church can stumble and has stumbled countless people. Some of my deepest wounds are from church leaders. God could have kept me from them. He chose not to. 
Why, Michael? Always the same three reasons. Number one, it will release more of his glory than if he keeps it from happening to you. I don't believe that. Well, you need to read the cross a little more. Biggest injustice in the history of man, biggest display of the attributes and glory of God. Number two, the Lord allowed that to to happen. It doesn't excuse the people, but he allowed it to happen to you to make you more like him. And number three, it's for your good. So here's what I told the camp staffs, and I'll finish with this. I told the staffs, you guys, on that great day, when every single person will have their time in line, one at a time, oh, Gertie, that'll take too long, billions of people. Yeah, eternity, that's that's a lot of time. One at a time, you'll give an explanation for every single thing you did in your life. One at a time. I want to have our camps in such a way that when these deconstructors, when they stand before God, of course, the Bible says they're going to be exposed naked. Everything, all the hidden reasons why and what they really are is going to be for all to see. And the Bible says every mouth will be stopped and they won't be able to say anything. But here's my quest as a church leader or as a ministry leader, I should say. I don't want them to have any reason. Or, or, there, there's, they, there's no way that they could turn around. He did or didn't do this. That's my quest for the camps too. Hopewell Network camps, by God's grace, we're blameless. And I know that's the heart of your pastor and pastors is that we want local to be such a people of the dwelling of God where God just doesn't possess this sanctuary for a little while. You'll be blameless on that day when your detractors would try to come after you. Amen? Let's pray. We know he will never leave us nor forsake us. Hallelujah. Here's what I charged the camp staffs with many years ago. God will not leave his people ever. He stays, but does he spray? I put an aerosol can on the object lesson table. I said, God will never leave you. He came in the building with you. He was here before you got here. But how many of you have been in meetings where you didn't sense a release of his presence? And then nothing's worse. There's no greater agony in life than being in a religious service, amen, where God's presence isn't released. He stays, but does he spray? The heart of the leadership of this church is they want God to spray every single time, beloved, you come here and gather. How does that happen, Michael? Right here. The text and the spirit. Amen? Text only, dry, know-it-all, critical. Pursuing experience only, flaky, stay away from me. But when you have them both, that's the blend. That's the blend. That's what we're after. Amen? Father, thank you for this precious group of people. Lord, I marvel as how much you have multiplied it in two years since I was last with them, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the heart you have given the leaders. I'm going to ask the adults in the room to just reach out your hand and lay it on the shoulder or the head of any kids that are near you. They don't have to be your children, beloved. And I'm going to ask you, ask the Lord, as you touch them, young people, as the the adults touch you and lay their hand on, I want you to bow your head before the Lord and ask Jesus to touch you. It says that when they brought kids to Jesus, it says he took them in his arms, he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. And Lord, I'm asking you, like that little boy on the first slide at the beginning, who was stunned, I'm asking you, Lord, the Spirit of God would move on these precious young people of local church.
Aristotle said that I am very much convinced that the fate of empires depends on the education of youth. I ask you, Father, this would be an incubator for the children and teens at local. Spirit of God, Lord, would not let them go, that you would stun them, Lord. Stir hunger for you as you did in Samson. He's here, beloved. Just let him minister to you. <laughs>